Monday is here. We got a little few more shop AC stories here for you. And uh, I had actually done this uh, presentation over at the college and I had filmed myself doing it over there, but I wanted to tweak it a little bit and put some more information in here than what I had given over there because as I went through it, I realized there were some things I had left out. And these are basically some stories. I mean, I, you might notice that a lot of the stories that I tell aren't on brand new vehicles. You know, I try to keep it as con as contemporary as possible. But with the price of used cars the way they are nowadays, there are a lot of people that are still driving older cars, including in places like California where old cars don't die. You know, where people are going to keep on uh, driving the uh, cars as long as they want to. Let me turn that light off for anything. I may get a little bit better deal here. All right, now then. This was a Buick with an inoperative AC. Uh, this uh, lady that worked with me up there, this was her parents' car. She brought it up there. It was a 93 Buick Park Avenue. And it was blowing nothing but hot air. You know, and, and so it, and it happened for a pretty good while. And the AC clutch wasn't engaging. You know, what I had often always told you is if you're, you know, you turn on the AC, make sure you know how to turn it on. Look to see if the AC clutch is running. If the AC clutch is not running, you need to then go and see if you've got enough refrigerant in there to even close the low pressure cutout switch. Uh, but they had the temperature. This was a fancy uh, climate control. You know, this is all the bells and whistles on this car and everything. And so I said, well, I need to go ahead and we're going if we're going to check the R12 system to see how much refrigerant is in it, we first need to get our refrigerant identifier and connect to this. And it was originally outfitted with R12. And I noticed that it still had the R12 charge port fittings up, you know, that were original. <clears throat> One of them took a special tool, uh, which was a peculiar thing. I did not see that coming at the time because I'd never seen one of those before. So I had to buy that tool to even connect my R12 side of my machine to it. I mean, the R12 hose from not the, you know, from the refrigerant identifier. So I hooked that thing up and it failed and it said it was 100% R134. Now this wasn't the only time I had seen that. There was a Taurus uh, there was a 92 Taurus that had belonged to the college that still had R12 fittings on it, and it had 100% R134 in it. See, that's one of the dangers of working on this, especially if you've got your refrigerant recycler machine that's going to pump refrigerant into your tanks on your machine and then put it back in other cars. You need to know what's in that thing. And I know it's a, I know a refrigerant identifier is pricey, but the simple fact is you really need one if you're serious about doing AC work or you'll be spreading all kinds of trash gas into your machine and then all the other cars you service. It's just really not a good idea to go that route. So this was something that we needed to deal with, you know, right to start with. And so what we basically had to do was <clears throat> we were going to deal with that later. But for the time being, we needed to find out what in the Sam Hill was going on and why the compressor clutch would not operate. Now, this system right here is a, this is basically a schematic of this system, and it looks really complicated. You know, GM like to call their processing center of the uh, uh, automatic climate control systems the HVAC programmer. If you look on a 71 Cadillac Eldorado, there's a great big old unit under the right side of the dash that's as big as an ice chest or something, and it's they call that the HVAC programmer, and those have got automatic climate control where you set it to whatever temperature you want, and it keeps it at that temperature. Uh, but I've worked on some of those old Cadillacs, and they've got a huge program, program under there. But as time went on, the programmer got smaller and smaller and smaller, and then eventually they moved the, the, that into the body computer and one thing like that and all that. So the center of the system is the HVAC programmer. Now the CPU in the unit untangles all of this input data to the AC and it operates the AC compressor clutch accordingly. And so here we are, that's a schematic of that and how that all works over here. You see you got your blower speed control, you got your and it's got a variable blower speed controller, which just about always you got on automatic climate controls, because it needs to control the blower speed, but you can dial that little thing up and down and you can get that. One of those back on there was a Pontiac back in the 60s, I don't remember which one it was. It had cruise control that worked that way. Once you got your cruise control, well, you turn a little thumb wheel to the speed you wanted it to hold it at, and it would do that. But anyway, there's your blower motor. There's your compressor clutch and the compressor clutch uh, diode, and so on and so forth, and the relay control, so and all that. And so uh, there is your AC clutch, uh, clutch relay, you know, with the power feeding that. So you know, it's your your power is feeding the coil, and it's also feeding the common terminal on the relay, and the compressor control 
actually turns that on and then it pulls the clutch through that. And then you got your little diode over there again. All right, so we can make this complicated if we want to. There's six pages of this. There's doggone six pages and you can say, well, this is downright scary and all, but what we need to do is just focus on what we're actually trying to figure out is, is the compressor clutch circuit sound? Is this something that we need to, to work on? In other words, if the compressor clutch circuit is sound, the relay is good and all this kind of stuff, then we, and it's just not, and the, and the engine controller is just not turning on the compressor clutch because it won't energize the relay, we need to find out which inputs to the what the electronics, whatever is controlling it, they call it the amplifier on some of the uh, Asian and uh, European cars. And they basically, the, the, the could, uh, programmer on this one and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So if there's a computer in charge of the compressor clutch and it's not turning it on, that's when we need to try to track down what's going on there. So what we did was we pulled the relay out. Like I'm always talking about this. I hammer on this all the time. We pull the relay out, get it out of the way. We've got, we're supposed to have two powers and two grounds here when we've turned on the air conditioner. So we turn that on, we have two powers and two grounds. On this one we just had, we had power, power, we had ground here, but we had no ground there. And that ground there is supposed to be coming through the AC clutch from that ground. And so we've, uh, was it a bad clutch? No, it was not. What we found out was somebody had let this wire harness hang too close to the doggone uh, belt and it had the belt had sawed its way through that harness and it just so happened that the ground for the compressor clutch was the one that was totally compromised so that it didn't even have a single strand that was touching and so that's why the clutch wouldn't work and that's one of the problems with an ohmmeter and a high impedance test light is if you've got one wire that's left in a piece of wire and, and that's the only one strand of wire that's left uh, it will burn that high impedance test light and will also tell your, your continuity, you know, your meter will even tell you you've got voltage or continuity or whatever. Uh, but there was no way that was ever going to work. So the, the relay was energized but the compressor wasn't running because we had an open circuit right here. And that's why we didn't read a ground when we pulled the relay out. We soldered, we heat shrinked, and we tie wrapped it back out of the way to keep it away from the dead gum belt. I don't know how it eventually how it got into the belt because we never worked on this car before, so I know we didn't do it. Uh, but anyway, that's what it looked like when we were done with it. All right. Finally, we went ahead and we recovered everything out of it. The, the R134. We managed to recover all of that, and then we replaced the fittings with the. We got rid of these old fittings, and we replaced them with the proper fittings. And whenever we got, if we, if we hadn't identified this, we'd have been in trouble. Well, we put the new fittings on there and we put the nice colored caps on it. And so we had R134 in the system. We knew that whoever had done it had had enough sense to put some of the right oil in there, some ester oil in there, so that they wouldn't wind up burning up the compressor by just, you know, putting R134 in there and feeding BI8, you know. All right, so cold air is good. Now, one time, I disconnected the low pressure cutout switch on a guy's pickup. This guy was worked out there and he says, hey, he says, uh, my air conditioner is not working. Do you think you could look at it? I was in fleet maintenance down in Texas at the time. And so I walked out there and I unplugged the high pressure, I mean the low pressure cutout switch on the accumulator and I bypassed it with a little piece of wire I had and the AC kicked on and I watched the compressor run for a minute and I noticed that the suction line was cold and it was cold all the way to the compressor which means he had plenty of refrigerant. I didn't even hook any gauges up. And I says, uh, I'm going to say that your problem is this low pressure cutout switch uh, that's supposed to cycle it off with you know at lower temperature. So he says, okay. So uh, after I troubleshot that, I says, you can screw that off there and screw another one back on there without letting the refrigerant out because it's just got a little Schrader valve behind it. And so this guy says, well, how much would, how much did do you, are you going to charge me for making this diagnosis? And I said, that'll be $65. And he goes, what? You just jumped a wire. And I said, yeah, but I knew which wire to jump. Actually, I didn't charge him anything. I just told him he could get one of those switches and took care of it there. And he got one and it fixed it and all that. So anyway, so this Lincoln, when I hit a bump, the blower motor always switches to high blow regardless. So I reached down there with a, using my long extension or a screwdriver or something or what it was. And I just bumped that uh, blower controller under the it's in the engine compartment on that one back there in front of the passenger side on the, the bulkhead on in you know so I bumped it and it went engine running blower on low I bumped it and it went to high blow <laughs> fast and I said oh boy okay so you bump this component 
and it goes to high blow, so what are you naturally going to assume? You're going to assume the component is what the problem is. So I uh, got the service rider to call the customer, and I told I says, uh, you've got to have a blower speed controller. And so what we're going to need to do here with this uh, is replace that. And it's going to be $100. Because they said it's electronics, and there's a relay in there and all that, you know, for your high blow. And so he... Uh, he gave us the green light on that, and so uh, from the Lincoln dealership up the road at the time, we got another blower controller because they had one in stock, and I was thinking, well, they had one in stock, they must move pretty fast, you know, so that sort of underscored what I was doing. So we put the blower speed controller on there, I bumped that new blower speed controller, and it went to high blow again. I was like, ah, uh, you know, well, that's pretty spooky because now they're not going to want this part back, and we just spent $100 of this guy's money and all that. Well, what I wound up doing, I found out that going to the relay in this thing that is supposed to put it on high blow, I had the, the circuit that was feeding the coil on that relay was only supposed to have voltage going to it whenever the uh, blow, high blow was called for. But there was 8 volts leaking out of the electronics on this control head to that high blow relay. It wasn't enough to close the relay, but it was enough if you bumped it, it would pull it shut and it would stay shut. It took a little bit of percussion on the relay for that 8 volts to pull those points together. It would hold them, but it wouldn't pull them to start with. And so what I wound up doing was I got a gauge tester, you know, the one with the three potentiometer knobs on it, so you can adjust it to anything you want. And I hooked those two wires up between, I took put one to ground and the other to this circuit going out to that relay and I kept fooling with the resistance you know adding resistance to that circuit until I got to about 150 ohms when I got to 150 ohms the 8 volts was gone but it, it could still the control head could still put it on high blow so basically the 8 volts was there just to bleed that voltage leak off the ground and I had taken the top off of the controller and I managed to solder a little 150 ohm resistor in there that fix that thing perfectly. Now I don't try that at home because most of the time when you start trying to do something like that it won't work. <laughs> I got lucky that time and I, you know, I felt kind of bad because I had sold the guy a part he didn't need to begin with. It was an easy trap to fall into though. And so uh, because I was able to fix it, you know, in a, in a way that wasn't dangerous. One of the things I told my students when I got to this particular slide was, and you all probably heard me say that on here, there's three things on a vehicle that you should never modify in any way. Don't modify the ABS, don't modify the cruise control, and don't modify the airbag system. If you modify any of those, you're subject to cause some serious problems, and you may even, you know, if, if the modification you did is discovered by an insurance investigator after something bad happens, they're liable to come after you for modifying something instead of leaving it like the OEM uh, originally designed it. <laughs> One one example of that, while I was talking, uh, this funny little story about this uh, co-worker of mine had this uh, ticket that he drew on this Jeep Cherokee that I talked about on here before, I think, and they said that he would tap the cruise. I mean, it said it wouldn't, it wouldn't cancel the cruise sometime when you tap the brake. And they had to, you know, have the presence of mind to reach over there and turn it off. And so my buddy, he was kind of jumpy anyway, uh, but he was a big, strong guy. Anyway, so he's driving this thing, and he hit the brake about 10 times, and it canceled the cruise every time. And he got sort of uh, lackadaisical in the way that he was checking this thing. Oh, he's just now doing, now I'm just joyriding around trying to get the cruise to cancel. So he'd set the cruise, he'd hit the brake, and it'd drop out. Well, finally, whenever that situation presented itself, he duplicated the concern after about 10 attempts. That thing... He mashed the brake and it didn't cancel the cruise. There was cars down there at the, at the traffic light that he was coming to imminently. And he just stiffened up his, uh, you know, uh, reflexively applied a lot more brake, you know, big leg muscles of his and all that. Well, I don't know if you know about those old Jeep Cherokees. They had 177 foot-pounds of torque and if they were in their power curve, you didn't have the brakes to stop one. And so this thing, when he hit the brake and started holding the brake, the cruise control system says, my goodness, we're slowing down and we haven't received a disengage, so let's just go ahead and keep applying the throttle so we can keep the speed up there. Well, next thing you know, he's got both feet on the brake pushing as hard as he can, and this Jeep is doing a burnout and smoking the back tires. 
before he could find the presence of mind to turn off the cruise control. But anyway, imagine a situation where you have modified somebody's cruise control. One example was this cruise control that had they had put LED lights back there for the stop lights, and then as soon as they installed the LED lights, there was no cruise because there was no ground coming through the conventional brake light bulbs to you know, when the, the uh, cruise control module reads the ground coming through those bulbs, and when you energize those bulbs, that ground is gone and it drops a cruise. Well, if it never sees a ground, you don't have any cruise. And so I hooked a test light in the hot and went to that wire going back to those stop lights, and it burned really, really dim. And we went back there, and I said, this is the wrong kind of lights. You know, he's going to have to put the original lights back on there if he wants the cruise control to work. And so the, the kid that I was helping with the troubleshooting was a sort of a, a newbie, a learner, and he said, well, why can't we just... Put a light bulb in there. No, 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 no. I said, you don't want to do that. I said, do not ever make any modification other than you, you're going to keep it just like OEM if you're working on cruise control, airbags, or ABS. Now, some of you other guys may think of other systems that you don't need to modify like that. Because anything that has the potential of causing somebody to crash because of your modification is a bad bet. So don't go there. All right, this 83 diesel Rabbit. I like this story right here because this was my own ride. This is a 55 mile and yeah, about mile per gallon diesel rabbit that I, and I had worked at the Volkswagen dealership and I went to Volkswagen school and all that, so I knew something about these. Uh, incidentally, it was a funny little thing. You know, this son of a gun, whenever you turned on the air conditioner, it would feel like you threw something under the wheel and slowed you down, you know, because the air conditioner pulled 8 or 10 horsepower or something like that, and these diesels. Were, were, they were really not race horses anyway. This was a high RPM diesel. It would turn up 5,000 RPM, but it just really didn't have a whole lot of power, although it got really good fuel economy. Well, you might notice they got these, these switches right here. And the switches that were on there, so that there was a 70% throttle switch that was used for the shift light. The shift light would come on orange when it was time for you to go up to your next gear, gear and that would help you get optimum fuel economy. And so I says, you know, whenever I go to 70% throttle, I'm wanting to be gone. So I think what I will do, I said, this is how it, this is how it looked before I did any of my modifications at all. And so I took, there's your 70% there's your throttle switch and there's your idle switch. Well, coming in between here, so you notice those are in series, right? All right, so coming in between here, I decided to go ahead and, and I even used the Volkswagen uh, type schematic. I put a wide open throttle relay, you know, Ford uses a wide open throttle relay on some of their older cars so that when you're all the way into it, the, the compressor clutch is being carried by the normally closed contacts on the relay, and when the relay is energized, see this was hot and run, and whenever that switch would close at the wide open throttle, uh, see I was between the idle switch and the wide open throttle switch, so the ground would ground that relay and it would drop it, it would close the relay. Now that relay is not really drawn right, but that was the way Volkswagen drew it. So when you energize it, it would drop the compressor clutch. So when I went into it at, you know, 70% or above throttle, it would drop the compressor clutch and that was like, you know, giving me a little bit more acceleration and that was important when I needed it, but it also kept me from going too deep into the throttle because if I wanted air conditioning and cold air I needed to keep it less than 70% throttle and that you know benefited too. This Cherokee, Ed said the AC would cool just fine in the morning but as the day wore on the AC would stop cooling. So here's Ed standing there looking at his white 2000 Cherokee. At the time I had a yellow 2001 model just like this. Alright so the ambient temperature was about 85 degrees. The unit was blowing cold. I didn't even collect the eight gauges because it was blowing so cold. And I speculated maybe the cooling fan wasn't working all the time. So I used my test light to check the fan. And I tested the fan relay and the fan relay were both fine. So look at the way this is wired. And it's really not an unusual way that they wire these regardless of what module is down here. On this 4 liter you got AC switch sense. See, this is from the control head. The, the PCM knows when you turn on the AC. That's an AC request. And it also has a fan request terminal down there. And then this one right here is AC switch sense. So AC switch sense would be uh, these switches here. So if your high pressure goes up, it clicks that one over there. If your low pressure, uh, you know, see that one there is running through the normally closed. And the high pressure basically is going to close this switch and open that one. So you're going to lose the 12 volts 
at this terminal right here. Even if that switch is closed, if this one opens, you still lost that 12 volts. Well, if that one's closed and there's low pressure one opens, you've still lost it. So either way, you're going to drop your AC compressor. Now, if the high pressure switch kicks on, the AC the radiator fan kicks on. That one there had a belt driven fan and it also had an electric fan side by side on that Jeep. Some of you guys are familiar with those, old, those Cherokees of this vintage will remember that. But anyway, that's basically the way it wired up. I've greatly simplified that schematic and got rid of a lot of the extraneous words and stuff. I left the wire colors and the circuit numbers and all that. All right, so that's just basically a reiteration of what I was telling you. So back probe the switch. I had this thing that I could back probe without damaging the connector, and I touched my meter to that. And we watched it for about 10 minutes with a hot system and a hot engine. And the compressor cycled off and on until finally it didn't. And we still saw the 12 volts here. So we didn't have to drop that out. Uh, I got behind the compressor clutch relay with a test light. Remember, I like using these low impedance test lights. So, because I, I like that little bit of load that, that that test light pulls. It's only about a quarter of an amp anyway. So anyhow, but it will energize a relay if you or go to the wire, to the coil side of the relay. Anyway, this right here was the wire that was going out. You can't do that on very many relays, but this one here didn't have anything in the way and so I could do it. It would turn on that light, but the clutch wouldn't come on. So we found out that all the way to the compressor, when we eventually finished with our checking, see, I could leave this right here with the compressor turned off. I could actually, if I had this connected to my uh, positive terminal, I would see a light there. And if I jumped power to that, that light would go off and the compressor would come on. Well, in this case, I had it hooked to ground and it was on the hot side of the terminal going to the compressor. It turned on that light, that compressor should be on, and for a while it did, but then finally this light would come on, the compressor quit coming on. So what I did was I bumped the dadgum pulley with a screwdriver, and it kicked in until the next time it cycled back off, and so I knew we had an air gap issue. And so on that one there, there's a little procedure for that. You're supposed to have a special puller, you know, a lot of times you can get by without that. And you, you pull that thing off and you take some shims out, you measure, you know, you set it so that the air gap is like it's supposed to be. Because, you know, every time that thing slaps in, it's going to, you know, there's going to be a little bit of metal loss there. The Jeep air gap spec was 16 to 31 thousandths of an inch on that one. And so once you get it set, I always like to shoot for about 20 thousandths on those myself. All right, the test on this presentation will be here tomorrow. And so whenever the test comes out tomorrow, you can take the test again and see how you do it. You had not seen any of the questions that I'm putting on tomorrow's test on my previous AC test this year. So let me know how you do on that. And I hope you guys got a little something out of this. And I'll talk to you all next time. Send me some messages.